can everybody hear me? I'm not sure that anybody's going to enter. Um, I'm gonna, I think we're going to go ahead and get started, if that's okay with people. Um, <clears throat> I want to start by welcoming everybody to the webinar. And if at any point you, for some reason, can't hear me, by all means, just um, type that into the system. And Christina, I'm, I'm Lindsay, and Christina can help us with audio here a bit. Um, I want to start by welcoming everybody and sort of giving you an idea of who we are and what we're going to do for the next bit of time together. And I'm going to introduce myself and um, Christina can introduce herself as well. I think we're both going to be on audio here. I'm Lindsay Manzo. I am an educator with Ohio Sea Grant and my day job is a high school science teacher in Westerville, Ohio, which is just northeast of Columbus, rather landlocked actually, and about two and a half hours south of Lake Erie. Um, I've been teaching for 13 years in the classroom as a high school science teacher. This year I'm teaching chemistry and AP environmental science. And I've been uh, working with Ohio Sea Grant for about five years now. And I'm just going to preface that this is a very different kind of teaching format for me. I'm used to being in my classroom or outside at our land lab with my kids. So to be speaking to a uh, computer is quite different for me. Um, I'm going to let Christina introduce herself. Sure. My name is Christina Diakis. I'm an outreach specialist with Ohio Sea Grant. My background is in communication science writing, but I'm also recently have been doing a lot of the um, educational aspects of our climate change education program. Our plan for today is to give you an overview of, of what we have out there in terms of the new curriculum that we've been updating and working on. And I'm going to start by just briefly talking about the ocean literacy principles and the Great Lakes literacy principles and the climate literacy principles. Hopefully most people have at least heard about what those are. And I'm going to give an overview real quick of what we have available, especially for the Great Lakes literacy principles on our website. Um, then I'm also going to talk about the climate change outreach team and the webinars that they are putting on. And then ultimately that's going to lead into the curriculum that we've been updating and that goes along with both the, the principal framework and also the webinars that are going on uh, via Ohio Sea Grant. So to start off, uh, most of us know that the Great Lakes are a vast span of, they cover a very large part of the region of this country. They make up the north coast of our country. Um, Across the region, there are over 85 million people, a quarter of the U.S. population, 13 million K-12 students, and that doesn't even include the adult learners that a lot of us work with. Um, also, the, you can see that the eastern seaboard on the picture there, the coastline of the Great Lakes, and this is just the coastline that is on the U.S. side, not the Canadian side, actually spans longer than the eastern shoreboard, which speaks a lot to the size of the region and the, the importance of the Great Lakes to our entire region. Um, Great Lakes do touch two countries, eight states, two provinces, and there are 19 tribes that live along the Great Lakes. Hopefully most people know that um, around 2007, um, probably aware that the ocean literacy principles were developed. And the document was published as a result of numerous collaborating agencies and they came up with the ocean literacy principles, which were seven essential principles that they felt made up the framework of what a literate person would know in ocean sciences. And each of those the seven literacy principles have additional fundamental concepts underneath all of them. And I'll show you later where you can actually access this document if you don't have it yet. Um, however, shortly after that, two years later, in 2009, the climate literacy principles came out. And again, it's the same idea, the same kind of concepts and framework. There are seven main ideas with a number of fundamental concepts under them. And these are the basically the concepts and the ideas that the scientists and the educators putting these together felt that a climate literate person would understand and be able to use in decision-making skills in their lifetime. A few years later, actually one year later after that, Great Lakes literacy principles were published. And the Great Lakes literacy principles, basically uh, there were a number of Great Lakes Sea Grant educators and Coasty Great Lakes staff that collaborated to bring the regional focus to the ocean literacy principles. 
the ocean literacy principles were adapted for use here in the Great Lakes region. Um, it, it came out of a need for, it's very hard sometimes as, a, as an outreach or an extension educator or anyone that was working in the Great Lakes to try to work with the stakeholders and talk and, and use ocean literacy principles and all of them are going, well, but we're on the Great Lakes. And while we might understand that we're technically all part of one ocean, it was sometimes hard to portray that to the people that we were working with. So the Great Lakes uh, literacy principles, similar concepts to the ocean literacy principles, but locally relevant and regionally relevant. The one difference also, and it's actually in the blue section, sort of the water there at the bottom, um, there is an eighth principle that has been added, and this adds in the cultural, the history, the environmental, and the economic concepts that may not have been addressed in the ocean literacy. I'm finding that there's a little bit of a sound issue. I'm going to pause just a second. Make sure we got a couple people hearing us. The Great Lakes Literacy Principles, which are the ones that we're going to focus on today, along with the Climate Literacy Principles, those are the two sets that are the guiding frameworks for the curriculum. Uh, those can be found at greatlakesliteracy.net. And we're going to look at that website in just a, a minute here so that you can see what it looks like and how you can access different things from it. I'm going to, as I go through this, uh, everything that I have, I'm working from a PowerPoint, but Certainly feel free as I'm, you know, talking through them this way. This is very awkward for me, actually. Um, the website, you can jump on greatlakesliteracy.net and certainly peruse at your own leisure and find the similar things that I'm going to be pointing out. Um, on the greatlakesliteracy.net website, a typical page would have the list, the principle at the top, and the list of fundamental concepts underneath it. And then at the bottom, there are, there's a link to the resources as well as the alignment to the different standards. And currently up there are the older version of the National Science Education Standards, and these are in the process of being updated to match the new next generation science education standards as those become finalized. You can also see that on the right-hand side, um, you can access any of the eight principles just by clicking on one of the numbers on the right-hand side. And as I, I'm sort of going to go through each page, um, the important page, I think, for us here is the resource page. So if you were to click on the resources at the bottom or resources at the top, and I chose to pick principle number three because this is the one that deals with climate, which is what we're talking about today. So the way that a web page is um, set up, and I don't know if you can see, you can't see my mouth. Okay. Um, on the left-hand side is le our lessons and activities. And there's a resource page for every principle. And on the left-hand side, the activities are either from Fresh and Salt or Cozy's Greatest of the Great Lakes. And both of those, oh, thank you. So over here would be Fresh and Salt and Cozy's Greatest of the Great Lakes. And these are Cozy curricula that came out a number of years ago. Actually, most of the activities have already been around, but they've just been compiled here. And the goal here was to put all the resources in one place. To, to make it sort of a portal, portal for Great Lakes education at this point. There's usually a section two um, that is going to talk about the other related lessons, and I'll go through that here in just a second. Right, let me explain that for you. Um, so here, this is a little bit easier for you to see. Fresh and salt, and then greatest of the Great Lakes. And you can click on any of them. You can see that they're just simply PDF files. So a teacher can print them out, a teacher can use them. Um, sometimes there are web-based activities, such as this one, who owns the water of the Great Lakes. These other related lessons um, are either ones that have been produced by other Sea Grant offices in the Great Lakes region or from different NGOs uh, across the Great Lakes region that these are usually curricula that are readily available on the website. Also on a page, a resource page, you're going to find if there are any applicable online presentations. And most of these are ones that are uh, on the College of Exploration's website. There, you do have to log in and register them, but with them, but it's very easy, very simple, free process. 
Um, and these are presentations related to the specific resources. And these are ones that were done when Pussy Great Lakes was very active. And they are specific to the principal. There's also then a number of related websites that go along with the principal. And the impetus behind putting all of this together, again, was to put all the resources that a teacher might need at their fingertips. So they weren't trying to go to many different sites, many different places. They have the lesson. They have an animation that might go with it. They have everything that they would need in one spot. We truly want to be this portal for Great Lakes literacy. Also included would be data sets and any other miscellaneous resources. And quite frankly, the miscellaneous resources, in my mind, these are the ancillary things. Um, fact sheets, if I have students that are at different reading levels, a textbook may not be the best source of a, for, a, for a reading that I want them to do. We've tried to put in any applicable fact sheets or other information, the photo gallery, if you need to put together a PowerPoint, all of this information together for you. Um, also on this site, there's a section called Other Resources. There is a direct link to the National Science Standards Alignment, and again, that's being updated. There are also um, links to the Sea Grant offices for the region. Um, that's what you can see here, some of the different NOAA entities. Also, there are other Great Lakes curricula that are available that certainly climate education and Great Lakes education resources can be found, and we've tried to put them all in one spot as well. And finally, we have a section just for some general Great Lakes data and information. A lot of these are live data sites. Um, the Great Lakes Atlas is a great resource. Uh, great Lakes Observing System uses SUI systems in order to collect data so students can analyze it as a real-time um, kind of thing. And GreatLakesLessons.com is another source that has a lot of just general Great Lakes information. Again, the goal here was just to put everything in one spot for teachers to make it easier for them. Lastly, there's a section at the bottom called the helpful links that just has the direct link to the ocean literacy, uh, climate. There's also Lake Erie literacy principles. I believe Lake Erie is the only lake right now that has them specific to our lake. Um, NMEA, the National Marine Educators Association, and GLEAM, which is a regional chapter of NMEA. Okay, I'm, I'm going to test this out here. Are there any questions at this point or... I think Christina is, has been typing as I've been talking, so I think she's trying to answer some of them. Um, Christina, do we do questions now, or do we just go forward? Go ahead a little bit more, and then we'll, I'll let you know if we have enough for like a break. Okay, that works if that works for everybody else. Okay, so that sort of gives us a, a broad overview of the sets of literacy principles. And again, I didn't go through all the climate ones, but more for the Great Lakes ones because that's one of the websites that we are created here from Ohio Sea Grant that we're trying to use as that portal to house as many things as we can for Great Lakes education. Um, the principles do, though, serve as a framework. And what I'm going to do now is focus on some of the initiatives here at Ohio Sea Grant um, that we're working on that focus on addressing climate change in the Great Lakes region. Ohio State and Ohio Sea Grant is part of a partnership that involves multiple departments here at Ohio State University, and their goal is working to share research that is related to climate science and climate change issues specific to the Great Lakes region. And one of the major uh, products that's come out of this collaboration is a set of changing uh, climate change webinars. And the webinars are now in their third year, and we are just about ready to do our 25th webinar this upcoming November. Um, we've had a lot of great success with these, and the goal here is to take, have received, sorry, scientists and researchers that are doing relevant research in the region, specific to the region for climate change, and they are providing the webinar just like this, where participants can ask questions, hear the presentations. Um, one of the really nice things is that all of the webinars are archived. And they are on the site, and I'll show you where that is here in just a second. Actually, I might be able 
believe if you click up here under webinar, it will go to the archive. I can't, I think I can right now from my screen, I'm not going to try to flip over, but that's where you would, would get to that. You can also look at them by topics and other things as well. Um, I'm actually going to go through, if this should scroll through. What I've done is I've put up some, just some screenshots of some of the different ones that we've done. So you can see an idea of the topics if you aren't familiar with them. And this area right down here, um, where it says GLLP and CLP, these are the Great Lakes Literacy Principles and the Climate Literacy Principles. And what we've done is we've made sure that we're using those frameworks and aligning the webinars. We're seeing where they fit in this framework. And that way we can see, are we addressing all the different aspects or the principles of the different frameworks? Are we, or we seem to be focusing more on just one, things like that. I can click through and just sort of give you a brief idea of some of the topics that we've been doing over the past three years. One of the things that I really like about the webinars is the fact that they're archived. I often can't take the entire class time or the class time. My class times don't match up with the times the webinars may be offered. But it's been really great to be able to go back and watch the webinar. And sometimes the science is a little bit above my students or what I might be able to use it for. But I can take clips and show them different pieces and parts. Um, and I can see I'm looking at Christina's screen and I can see Angie is out there going, she loves it and she's using it with her middle school students. So she can probably chime in a little bit on this as well. I don't know if that's possible, but um, I know she does have some good experience with it. But I find it very useful to show the clips of the webinars to the high school students. And then if you actually go to the website under features, there are articles that have been written by the communication staff here at Ohio State Grant that do a really good job of summarizing the webinar and, and the science that they're talking about in the webinar. And I often use those as the homework before the webinar having my students read those, and I usually write questions for them just to make sure that they're reading through them and pulling out the right information. But then they get the gist of the entire webinar, and we can watch just the parts that are really pertinent to us. Um, there's also a section, too, uh, under topics, where Ohio State Grant has done a really good job of putting, again, other resources that might be relevant to that, that topic of the webinar for educators, informal educators, formal educators, et cetera. And they've done a really, I, I love those, oftentimes it's a website or it leads to um, a peer-reviewed journal article and my AP environmental students hate me when I hand them those to them, but it's giving them a lot of practice to be able to read the articles, the peer-reviewed journal articles, and then to be able to watch the webinar and sort of see how everything all fits together. And at this point, I am going to jump to the curriculum background and really get into the meat of the curriculum. So is this a good question time or? OK, I'm going to keep going then. I'm getting the patient to keep going. Um, back in 1995, uh, when GLIMPSE was, was produced, and GLIMPSE stands for Great Lakes Instructional Material for the Changing Earth System. And many of you know, probably know, or are familiar with Dr. Roseanne Partner, and she had the foresight in the early 90s to see the need for a climate change curriculum for the Great Lakes, which was just brilliant foreshadowing, I think, on her part. Um, however, you have to realize that 15 years later, we probably need to update things. Certainly, education has changed in that amount of time. I actually graduated high school in 95, and now I'm teaching it, so it's definitely a little bit different. Um, so what we've done is that being our main set of activities, that, that is an already a published book. Um, they don't print it anymore, but we have all, we have the copies and we have it online. Um, we're now updating them in terms of the climate science, the pedagogy, uh, the data sets. A lot of the data sets may have ended in the early 90s, and certainly here 10 years later, we have more data to add to them. We've also tried to add technology components because, again, technology has definitely changed. And as well as making it a little bit more user friendly for both teachers and students. One of the things about the original book is, uh, as a teacher, when I first was trained in using this book, the answers to the questions were on the same page. 
And I found that very frustrating because I usually was doing 20 things as all of us usually are at one time and thinking, oh my gosh, I have to sit, I have to retype this, is this going to work? Um, I really tried to make it user friendly on both ends. So ultimately, the plan here is to choose roughly 15 lessons, and not every single one is coming from glimpses. We are using a, an earlier publication that preceded this called ACES, which was Activities for a Changing Earth System, which was the predecessor to the glimpses. So we are updating approximately 15 lessons that span a variety of topics, but they are all relevant to climate change impacts in the Great Lakes. The curriculum activities can be found back on the Changing Climate website, and if you click under Topics and scroll down to the bottom, it will say Education. I think. Yep. And then Education, when you click on Education, it will have on the bottom right-hand side of the page is the Great Lakes curriculum. And there is a list of the activities there. Um, there aren't quite 15 up there, and some of them are actually a group of activities, and I'll tell you which ones those are here in just a minute. But that is one location that you can find everything. The other place that the curriculum is being housed is back on the GreatLakesLiteracy.net site. Because again, that was the whole point, was to keep everything as best we could in one spot. So under principle number three, because that's the one that focuses on climate, all of these updated lessons are available there as well. And you have the ancillary resources system. And then there's also a link from this one directly on this page, directly back to the webinar page, um, so that teachers can get back and forth between both of those things from either site. So the activities uh, that we have updated and that are on the website, there is a set of activities, and if I, I've put in there if it's more lessons than just one. If there's nothing there, that's just sort of a single standalone lesson. We have a set called Visualizing Changes, uh, Global and Great Lakes Climate Change, Greenhouse Gases. We have an activity that focuses on climate change impacts with aquatic invasives. We have a series of four lessons that deal with estuaries. Two of them are fully completed. The other, their last two are, we're sort of working on the graphic design end of them and making sure some of the maps are available electronically as well as hard copy as well, and then those will be posted. We have a four-lesson compendium about climate change impact on trees. Um, also, we have a Google Earth activity that deals with climate change here in Ohio, and then we have a role play activity called Cars on Trial. And what I'm going to do is I am going to briefly give everybody just an overview of what those activities are. And I have a question here. Do you have many on-site activities for grades three and up? Uh, for hands-on time. I'm going to say, the question is asking you, if, I was asking if these, what's the grade level? Most of these are middle to high school. Grade three, some of these can certainly be adapted down, but grade three, I'm thinking, might be a little bit of a challenge. Um, possibly, possibly some of these could. I think um, as you hear me sort of talk about them, you may be able to decide that for yourself. Um, but I'm thinking most of these, and that's what I put on as we get to the other slide, most of these are going to be middle school or high school. And Dr. Fortner is on, and she's actually saying that, um, can you guys see that? Can you guys yeah. see? Okay. Um, the visualizing, visualizing changes, there are activities there that would work for grade three. Some of the upcoming lesson topics, too, and these are very much in the process of being developed. Um, that's still going to take us a little while to get through all of these. We are looking at an activity that will deal with changes in fish habitat, uh, water levels, ice cover, ones on human health. That's actually become a very, um, very relevant topic these days. Uh, one that will look at pollen data, look at climate change throughout the region, uh, and how we look at that from proxy data, as well as with ice cores. And also one that talks about uh, could be another role play on how we could allocate water resources. Um, so I'm going to go through at this point, I'm going to talk a little bit about the basic framework of the lessons and what they actually look like, and then I'm going to go through a few as well here, so ones that we have all updated and that are available on the website. 
So in terms of the lesson framework, uh, the main parts of every lesson, there is a teacher component and a student component, so they are as ready to go as possible. The teacher can look at the PDF, they can print out the pages that the students need. All the answers are available um, on the teacher page as well, and anything that needs to be reproducible. We've tried to put it in that PDF format so the teacher can reproduce those very easily. Um, they can make one set, they can make it laminated, they can get it ready to go for multiple years. That was one of the goals in doing this. So the basic framework, every lesson, and we'll look at a lesson here in just a minute, um, is going to have background information. The objectives are clearly stated right at the top so the teacher can see what the, the main content address is in the lesson. We have a list of materials and estimated time required. And we've left that sort of general. Um, oftentimes in writing the lessons, you know, we would say one class period or two class periods. That differs, obviously, between every single building, it seems like. Um, we've also tried to show you the alignment. And all of these have been aligned with the framework that we currently have for the Next Generation Science Standards, the Great Lakes Literacy Principles, and the Climate Literacy Principles. So you can see where every lesson fits into these broader frameworks. Then the meat of the activity is the lesson itself, and that focuses on the five E's, and being engage, explore, explain, extend, and evaluate. And I do know there's a, a lot of research out there, and sometimes there's, people have published if there are really seven E's, or eight E's, or nine E's, we stuck to the basic five, just to keep it pretty simple, so that a teacher can follow through very easily with this. We've also tried to put additional resources that might be of assistance to a teacher or to an educator, uh, with each lesson, and then also there are references in the lesson as well. I'm going to start, and I'm going to go through basically the list that I showed you a few minutes ago. I'm just going to go through and give you a very brief overview of each of the activities. And this past summer, Dr. Fortner and I um, co-taught a class on global climate change and Great Lakes climate change issues up at Stone Laboratory which is basically a six and a half acre biological research station on Lake Erie. And it is the best place in the world to have a class. And we had uh, six or seven teachers up there this year. And they were actually trying and learning just as much about the activities as what you are now. But they were doing all of them with us up there. So I have a number of pictures. And those are the pictures that you're going to see. These are pictures that the teachers have done. Sometimes we've also done some other uh, workshops in one in Toledo and one in Cleveland for educators this past summer. So some of the pictures are from those as well. There's a handful of ones for my students doing it in here too that I've, I've put in. Um, all of these activities I have done with my students, either not this year so much in my AP environmental, but I taught ecology and environmental biology for a long time. And my students have done most of these activities as well in my classroom. So the first um, set of activities is visualizing changes. There are two lessons. And the first one we often call, I tend to call it the more or less activity. And it's basically construction of a concept map. And the educator is given a central concept, global warming, and you need to make words that say more and less. And then there are a number of different just topics. Everything from cows to irrigation to water levels rising to shoreline development. It's a number of different topics. And students have to try to look at the cause and effect relationship and basically create a construction, uh, a concept map, construct a concept map. And there are not a lot of rules for it. They can start in the middle and go out. Sometimes um, I've done this where we put the sort of things leading to global warming and the things, the impacts coming out of global warming, one on each side. Um, the lesson is written in all of the words that you see on that board are available in the activity, but certainly you can make more. And I have done that. I have written crazy words, frogs, um, malaria, just picked any kind of other words. And sometimes it really stretches the student's brain to try to think, well, how is this connected? And I've actually been quite happy for the whole group to say, this is not related at all. And we discuss why. This is a great activity to use either as a pre, and I've done it pre and post assessment. I've also made my own sets of the words on 
smaller pieces of paper that we've done this whole group as a pre-assessment at the beginning of the unit, and at the end of the unit, then students work in smaller groups with the strips of paper and have to actually create their own within the small groups and where they have to then write about their explanations. Um, the second activity is a writing activity where students have to write a letter. Basically, they're, they're envisioning themselves as grandparents and what are they going to tell their grandchildren about what the climate in the area was like when they were here. Um, this is a great activity for formal or informal audiences. Uh, I think recently, and Christina has seen the picture, at a recent the Sea Grant, correct me if I'm wrong, Sea Grant Network meeting, the Great Lakes Grant Network meeting. Yes, um, a group of outreach and educators, uh, outreach specialists and educators use the same concept, but for a different topic. But they use the same strategy. Um, I actually have this for a number of different topics, I, and I believe it actually originated out of a human population, a, an increase in human population, and you can do the same kind of thing. There's another one um, that I've used before, and it's for um, litter along the shoreline. What are the impacts? So you can pick your word for the middle, but it can then branch out from there. But this is a really, really great way for kids to put the whole big picture together and see cause, the effect, effects that are, that are happening because of the climate change. This is one that um, definitely you could adapt down to third grade level. Probably would need to change some of the words. There are probably words, vocab words that third graders wouldn't know quite yet, but that could be done very easily. Activity is global and Great Lakes climate change, and this is one of my absolute favorites to do with my students. This is a graphing activity, and students are initially given some short data sets, 15 to 20 years long, and they're asked to graph them. And one of the first things we have to do is we have to figure out our scale, and that's one of the modifications I would suggest if you are going to use this with middle school students um, or any students with IEPs. You may want to go ahead and talk about scale ahead of time and then give them the papers that are included with the lesson, and, but go ahead and add on the scale for them. I know for me, with my lower level students, it, I taught ESL students for a long time. Um, writing the scale could take the whole class period, and that wasn't the meat, the meat of the activity that I wanted them to really see. So you might talk about that and then let them go on with the activity afterwards. Anyway, they're given um, short intervals of temperature anomaly data, the difference between the global average temperature and then what we were seeing over a number of years. And they have, there are two sets, one for Cloquet, um, which is a city in the Great Lakes region up in Minnesota, and then also the global data. And when you look at it only over 15 or 20 years, you might, oh, well, you know, I don't know, is climate change really happening? I know, or is global warming happening? Is our average global temperature changing in a positive way, is it not? And then what you do is you ask them to put them all together. And that's what you can see what are the students doing this summer is they're, they're starting to take all these individual graphs together and ultimately then they see the big picture over a span of years. And Diane uh, Desitel out of Minnesota Sea Grant took this activity and did an interesting twist that I absolutely love and I'm going to show that to you here. She plotted each of the five data sets, and they have it for global. She did it for global and the regional data, but I just put the global up here. And plotted it in Excel, gave each set a color, and then students were really able to see the differences between trends and variation. And also to see that when you put these individual data sets together, what we're now seeing over that span of 1880 up to 2010. So you can imagine the students that have the set of data that's from 1880 to 1910 approximately, and they're going, what are you talking about? Temperatures are going down. And then you really start to see, you know, you have the other student who has 1990, the last you know, 25 years, 20 to 25 years, going, really? Well, what are you talking about? My numbers are going up. But I think this really gives students a clear picture of the data sets that we have. Um, it allows you to talk about trends and variations. Uh, you don't have to do it with the technology component, but once Diane added this piece, we then added that into the lesson so that that was available to teachers. 
we've provided them with this graphic, they can show it, or we've provided them with the instructions on how they can have their students create this in Excel, which is a fabulous skill. I think that this is definitely an activity for a formal audience, but you could certainly do it with an informal audience if you, if you wanted to. Um, I would most likely use this with high school students just because of the graphing component, especially if you're going to use the Excel component as well. Am I good to keep going, Christina, or do we have questions? What was comment here? Okay. And I'm going to read a comment. This is from Carly Martin. Um, it says, people wishing to teach climate change to young children. I would suggest that they read uh, Beyond Ecophobia by David Sobel, available on the internet. I use his suggestions as a good model for not just sharing, or for not sharing tragedies to younger audiences. I think education would be appropriate, but climate change may be best introduced to middle students and older. I'm just reading the comment here from our screen. I'm going to keep going. I think I agree with her too that um, climate change can sometimes be presented in an overly negative fashion. Um, okay, would you please type the name of that book? Um, Okay, I think Christina can do it from her screen down there, where she is at. I'm not sure that I can find. Christina, is, I'm just waiting a second so that she can get that up so that everybody can see that. And she's got the book up there, and it looks like Carly is very gracious to provide us with the link here. Awesome. One of the next activities, and this is a, an inquiry-based lab, and it's about greenhouse gases. And it's looking at the differences um, in air temperature change with just basic air with CO2, and you could even do it with water vapor. This is definitely what I would call the, the traditional inquiry-based lab that you would do in a classroom setting. Um, I have done it in my classroom with my students before. That's probably the best setting really for it. And it uses one liter bottles, and you can certainly use other size bottles, but one liter bottles work very well. Um, this is definitely probably a more intensive lab in terms of materials. And what you do is you use, and I'm actually gonna flip to, I have some more pictures here just to show um, you use CO2 cartridges that a lot of uh, a lot of times you can find them at bike stores. They're what bikers would carry if they're they didn't get a flat tire. They can use it to inflate their tires very easily. You can also get them on Amazon and a number of other places. Um, but you put CO2 in one of the bottles, and we had just regular air in another bottle. We just capped it, and you could also do it. We had a one group this summer try it with misting the bottle with water because water vapor is a major greenhouse gas. And the goal is to look at what does the air temperature do? And these are sitting in the sun, so what does the temperature do? And it really gives students an idea of what the greenhouse effect is. And they can collect their data, they can analyze their data and see different temperature changes. Um, this one is definitely a technique one, one that it took me a number of times to practice to really figure out how do I get the thermometer to stay in the bottle in the best fashion um, in order to get it through the stopper, we've used clay, we've used Play-Doh, um, we've had Vaseline on stoppers to really get a good seal. Um, we've also figured out that we needed, at one point, um, you can see, I was using, these are takeout boxes, but we were balancing the thermometers on the takeout boxes just so that it didn't tip over. Um, over here, this is from a class a couple of years ago, and we're actually recording our data right on the paper. Uh, it's, it's actually really, the hardest thing for me with this one is if you have a short class period, it's a challenge to do it that quickly. It's one that really you need to collect data over a period of time. But I think it does an excellent job at showing students what the greenhouse effect is. This is one too, again, I think I may have mentioned, I definitely would say that this is a high school student one. 
just in all the materials set up, and you probably would have, if you have block periods, it would be a great way to do this one as well. The next activity, oh, got a question. Is this something you could set up for multiple days? Is it something I could leave set up for multiple days? I would say no, um, because you need a sunny day, and if you're leaving it set up for days, unless you have somebody who's going to be able to record data overnight, then it would be a challenge. Um, I know when we were doing it up at the lab, I've always done it outside. It's actually written that you could do it under lamps in a classroom, under heat lamps, and that's certainly an option. I've always done it outside, though, and we've just made, you know, we've got to have that sunny day, and when I have blocked classes, that was great because we had a, a solid hour and a half. I think the hardest thing to do is to get it set up and see any change and to really collect data in say, a 45-minute period is a challenge. Um, the next activity, climate change and aquatic invasives, it uses the idea of a jigsaw, and it's also a really great way to put in sort of authentic assessment. And I'll show you some more pictures here in just a second to explain a jigsaw. But what students ultimately do is they use fact sheets that can be accessed either through the internet, and there's also an internet, um, a database for aquatic, uh, aquatic new species, and they have to become experts in one or two aquatic nuisance species. And then what they do is after they become experts, they form new groups where they then use their aquatic nuisance species expertise to match the origin with the picture, the description, the ecosystem impact, and how climate change will affect that organism. This one I think is a great one that can be done with an informal or a formal audience. I would definitely say it's an upper middle school or high school level activity. All of the fact sheets that they're using are produced by some, some one of the Great Lakes Sea Grant offices or through Glaral. And the database that they're using, if you're having them do online research in order to get the information initially, is um, also a resource that's put out by Glaral. And the question sheets that the students would work through and all the fact sheets are available on the student pages. And if you're not familiar with a jigsaw, let me see if I can. There we go. Um, the way that a jigsaw works is, and I, the way that I've done it here is I've just developed a graphic that shows that um, if I have a class of 24 students, I will assign six students to become experts with the white perch and the Asian carp, six with two other um, ANS species, six with two others, and six with two others. And that would be their homework for the night. They have to get the fact sheet, they have to answer the questions, some are general questions about aquatic invasive species. Others are, are particular to the ones that they're uh, assigned. And then they're broken up the next day. You have somebody you know, from the red group, somebody from the yellow, the green, and the purple group. And they now go into their card matching groups. And they're given a set of cards. And I'm going to go back because I think you can see right here. The cards, uh, you pre-print them on different color paper. And then you could have the students lay out, you know, all the pictures of the of the critters. And then you can say, okay, pick up the cards that have all the origins, and what can you do to match them? And the students have to bring their own expertise to the table in order to complete the challenge. And it's a really good way to do an authentic assessment. And, and it uses um, their skills to interpret the statements on the cards in order to really match up the critter with what it, where it came from, its impact, and what likely is its climate change impact, the impacts of climate change will have on it in the future. This is one that I actually love to do. Um, it's one of the ones, too, that we, the reason we added the fact sheet information in was to make it so that you didn't have to do a unit on aquatic invasive species ahead of time. That is built in. Or if maybe you don't have time to do a climate change unit, but you want to address climate change, if you're talking about aquatic nuisance species or aquatic invaders, you can be doing this and adding in the climate change piece as well. So the initial activity was just matching the cards, but we broadened it to bring in the fact sheets to really provide a background on the, the eight species that were chosen, and then to extend it to climate change. And just so you know, the eight species that were chosen are the ones that you see here listed, 
and there was a lot of debate on this. We had a couple different people from uh, scientists from across the region. We asked them for their top ten, and then we tried to pick the top eight out of that from the, the organisms that were showing up multiple times. But there was often debate over the top eight that we should really include in the lesson. And certainly, you could extend this lesson if you wanted to add more organisms. Uh, the templates are available. The fact sheets are out there. These are just the eight we chose. We kept it at eight to keep it a realistic time frame, something that you could get done in a class period. The next set of lessons deals with climate change and climate change impacts on estuaries. And the first two that you see here, ecological role of an estuary and estuaries impact on nutrients, are fully done, and those are the ones that are online and available. The other two are the ones we're fixing a little bit with um, in terms of the graphics and making sure that the data that we have is, is accurate. The lessons are not quite yet online, but they will be very, very soon. Okay. I think we're trying to wait and put them all four up there together so that it, it's a complete set. Um, ecological role of, it, of an estuary, and actually, there's the picture of that one there. You can see a teacher this summer. Um, it uses circles, or these were canning rings. You can use canning jar rings. I've actually used jelly bracelets. You can go to the dollar store and get a bunch of jelly bracelets to, to simulate the same kind of thing. And it's looking at spring and, or, or I'm sorry, spring and late summer um, populations of ichthyoplankton that you might take in a, in a plankton. So this is what I would call a dry lab, and it gives us an overview for students of how you might get a sample and estimate sample size and what kind of critters are there. I actually have used this one a number of times. I'm very fortunate we have a pond and an outside classroom and a land lab, and we do this one before we go out as a dry lab before students start to collect all their plankton to see what they might be doing. Um, estuary impacts on nutrients. If I go back, that's actually the one that's saying right there and you can see her working on this one. This is data sets, this is a graphing activity of nitrogen and phosphorus levels throughout the Old Woman Creek estuary. And it looks at levels upstream and downstream, all the way to the downstream end, right where the, the mouth of the creek empties into the lake. And at five different survey stations, what's happening to the nutrients after storm events as they go through an estuary? So you can see, Really what it ultimately shows is these levels are really high upstream and they end up really low downstream. The students can then start to interpret, you know, what is the role of the estuary in filtering out nutrients and how does it impact the nutrients that are emptying into, the lake, into Lake Erie um, from the, the Old Woman Creek watershed. Um, ecological, actually I think I, I missed book before, the estuaries, reading them in the wrong order, the role of estuaries as nurseries was the one that I talked about first. Ecological role of an estuary is more of an overview of estuaries. And you know, if, if climate change and water level changes, what might happen to some of the plants that are in an estuary and how the estuary functions? Wetland migration addresses the concept of um, the idea that water levels are expected to drop here in the Great Lakes. Whereas on a global scale, we talk about ocean and sea level rise. Here in the Great Lakes, we're expecting to see a drop in water levels. So what's going to happen to wetlands? Are wetlands going to possibly migrate? Are the areas that we have wetlands in going to change as water levels drop? And that's um, one that we're trying to find the, really the best bathymetric maps to use. And we're also looking to compare them what's going to happen at Old Spring Creek to what's going to happen at the Lake Superior Estuary um, up in Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin, actually, I believe, Minnesota, Wisconsin area. And Minna, just in case you're not familiar with them, Old Woman Creek and the Lake Superior are both, Lake Superior here, are both um, National Estuary and Research Reserves, the two that we have here in the Great Lakes region. Both of these I would use with classroom audiences, um, probably not so much an informal audience, but you could actually, I think the nutrients one is really compelling. And both of them, especially the nutrients one with the graphing, I would say is at a high school level. The next set of lessons.
Lessons, Trees on the Move is a compendium of four lessons. And um, I'm just going to briefly go through these as well here. We're going to, I'll show you some more pictures as well too. Um, there is one lesson that looks at climate models and how um, hardiness ranges are changing. If you ever look at the back of a seed packet, you might start to see that those hardiness ranges are changing. It may have, you know, used plants you used to plant, uh, vegetables you would plant here in central Ohio, well, maybe that range is expanding a little bit, and we're finding that temperature changes are allowing plants to be grown a little bit longer or here, or maybe the range is extending north. And that one looks at online models. The second one is an outside activity that simulates um, how trees might migrate. And the third activity is more of a paper pencil one where you're looking at temperature and seed germination. The fourth one then looks at the changes in maple population. Do I have a question? A comment. Oh, Dr. Fortner says, um, definitely these focus on buckeyes and sugar maples. Of course, buckeyes. How could I forget? It's Ohio State. Absolutely. Um, and sugar maples. And we have a picture here actually of some of the teachers. These are some of the educators working this summer. Um, to figure out, you know, where these trees move, and you can see Celia up here throwing the um, the maple seeds up in order to see how might a tree migrate and how is this going to happen and how far might they migrate. You can see that the teachers are outside with meter sticks, meter sticks, trying to determine this. These are really great ones. I I actually did um, the fourth one, which is can maples migrate. And I actually did that one not too long ago with my AP environmental students who are outside. And it was an absolute beautiful day. We're looking at tree density in an area. And then at the same time, we were saying, well, what can, how, what can we expect with changes in our land lab with the tree species in our land lab? And we were doing this exact one. Um, the next one that we're going to talk about is deals with it's a Google Earth activity. And it deals with the impact of climate change specifically in a Great Lakes state. And this was actually not one of the original activities in glimpses. Google Earth didn't exist in 1995 um, for that activity. But we have a teacher, um, actually a colleague of mine from Westerville North, Sue Wasmond, and she put together, she went to a class that was co-taught by David Hart and Dr. Portner on how do you incorporate Google Earth into lessons and how do you teach using Google Earth. And she wrote the activity, and in the lesson there are you can see these red points on here, and I'm not Google Earth, the Google Earth aficionado by any means here, but these are different points that she's found throughout Ohio, and students are able to study 14 different aspects of climate change by flying into those spots and clicking on them. And they address different topics like agriculture, human health, um, water levels, flooding, all different aspects of climate change specifically in Ohio. And the students then have to read about it at that site. And there, sometimes there's an external link that they have to go to. And they're learning about the different impacts of climate change here specifically in Ohio. Um, they have to answer questions that go with it. And that question page is provided for teachers so that it's ready to go. And the second part of her activity involves a write around, which is where students can literally sit in a circle. And one student starts off a sentence and multiple students start off sentences, and then they're asked to pass the paper to the person next to them, who then reads it and continues the story. And by the time you get through, you know, depending on how many students you have starting the, the, the write around, actually, if you even have a class of 24 students, and every student is starting with one sentence and passing it around, you could potentially get 24 really cool stories. Um, Definitely something I would use with a formal audience and probably best at the high school level as well. I've had a lot of people ask me, do you have this for other states? And my answer is no. Um, Sue Wasman wrote this for Ohio because she teaches here in Ohio, but it certainly could easily be adapted. And if you have the Google Earth expertise, you could easily create this for the other state or for the, the region of the lake that you're working around. Would be happy to um, once you have that tour completed, post it on our site as a tour for another state. Ooh, that would be awesome. That'd be great. 
that would actually be a welcome addition to be able to offer that for, you know, here we are in Ohio and, and our lake is Lake Erie, but certainly the other regions, that would be, be awesome. Um, the last activity that I'm going to talk about is called Cars on Trial, and this one is a role play, and literally ca the car is put on trial, and prior to the actual trial happening in the classroom, students are assigned roles, and it might be the defense attorney or the prosecuting attorney. There are witnesses. Air is a witness. Um, the high school, the student driver is a witness. Uh, the science, the climate scientists can be a witness. Um, they're all researching their roles, and they have to work together as a team. I would say that this is not an activity that you can say, okay, research your role tonight, we're having our trial tomorrow. The students need research time, and they need time to sit together and work on their arguments, because the, the, the defense attorney has to know what questions they need to ask the witness. And they need to have that, that dialogue before they, they get up to the stand there. But it's a really, really cool activity. The picture that you're seeing um, is what we would use as part of the engagement activity uh, so that the students, you know, I would put this up on my board. I have a smart board, and this would be up on my board as the students walk into the room. And this would get us talking about, well, you know, what's happening in this courtroom? Why might a car be on trial? What's going on? This is what I would use as my engagement activity to just wake up my students' brains and get them thinking about it. And then we would probably use the rest of the period to start figuring out who's going to represent each role, what kind of research do we need to do, and then that would lead us into probably a, a class period or two for research and for basically putting together their arguments and, you know, what are the kinds of questions that they're going to ask, and especially when you have to cross-examine because you don't know what the other side is going to be talking about. Um, all of the activities, and I haven't really talked too much about the specific parts of the lessons, but all of the activities have an engagement activity, whether it's something like this, whether it's a demonstration that goes with it. Most of what I have talked about has just been the meat of the actual lessons. This is one of my favorite ones to do. We had um, two years ago at the Global Climate Change Workshop uh, that Dr. Fortner and I did up at Stone Laboratory, we had a great person to play the car. And just, you know, you, you felt so bad that, you know, really, can you, can you convict the car in this trial or not? You did an awesome, awesome job. person you probably wouldn't have thought that would have done a great job with it, too, did an awesome job at playing the role of the car. A lot of people really got into their roles, and it was really great to see. Okay, at this point, I, I have planned for questions, and Christina, I think, is putting that together for us. Give me just one second. Dr. Fortner sent us a resource link for the Google Earth lesson. So I want to get that to all of you. And that is the chat box right now. And then we can go into questions. And I, Christina has some questions here. She's on another screen making it so that I can see it a little bit better. Um, has there been any connection with the algae in the southwestern basin and the greenhouse effect? Um, I'm not sure that I'm the person that's probably best to answer that question. There's probably probably our director or our assistant director here, Jeff Reuter, Chris, Chris Winslow, would be the better people to answer that. Um, I, I don't know from a scientific standpoint. I don't know the answer to that one. Um, on the greenhouse gas lesson, let me, I can put back Remember which one that was? Okay, can I? Perfect. It says on the greenhouse gas lesson. If you use temperature sensors and graphing calculators interface, you can set it up and leave it. That's a very good point. That is great. We have. I actually have never tried that. I would love to know how that works. Um, I know we have all the Vermeer equipment. I've never used the Lab Test 2. Um, but I, that would be something I had not thought of that, to be able to do that with our Vermeer sensors. That would be a great idea. I'm glad somebody suggested that. Um, it seems difficult to get the concept of parts per million across to an audience. What do you suggest? That's another question. 
Um, honestly, and I don't know which catalog it's from, you can buy the jars that have the tiny, tiny, tiny little beads that you can use as a demo. I have them, and I acquired them when I moved into the room that I have. I don't know where they came from. Flynn, Flynn, thank you, Liz. Liz is saying that Flynn has them. That demonstrate parts per million and parts per thousand, or part, well, parts per thousand, parts per million, parts per billion, all of that. Um, I also think there's a number, I've done a chemistry activity where you can look at that with food coloring, and um, you do it with a well plate and spot plate. And Brenda is saying that to enhance the sensors, I'm assuming you're talking about the lab pro sensors, uh, you can set up a time lapse camera focused on the temperature. If you take a picture throughout the day, you can show the temperature related uh, related to if it's sunny or if it's cloudy time. Ooh, that's a great idea. She's saying yes, that's the sensors that I'm referring to. So you could set up a time lapse camera if you have that available. I, I don't have one of those available, but that's something that absolutely that you could do. There is another question for the same thing with the greenhouse gas activity. It says for the CO2 cartridges, this came from Ann Keith at Oldman Creek. Um, would it work to leave it out overnight and collect the day throughout the day or would the gases escape over time? Just curious because they do an overnight teacher workshop. So they start it one day and finish it the next. Good question. I've never tried it. Um, I don't think the gas would escape as long as you have a good seal. Because technically, if the bottles are sealed, I, I probably wouldn't use Play-Doh. The picture that you're seeing here on the screen, this setup happened to be with Play-Doh. But this one here has stoppers. They've been sealed with Vaseline. So I think it might be something just to play with what material might make your best seal. For the short term time span, I've been fine with Play Doh or a clay, as long as the clay isn't too hard, that you can shape it still. Um, but you might play with some options there. That one is still truly, you know, sometimes I have students just in the way that they've set it up, if they've made a really good seal, if they haven't made a really good seal, this is one we have the basic setup, but I think it's you, you have to play with the best way to get it really together. This is a technique one. Oh, thank you, Liz. Liz put up the link from Flynn, and it's called the Becker Bottle. Yay, thank you. That's great. That's actually one that um, I probably need to pay attention to because I wouldn't mind having another set of those. Um, another question, it says, I work with the, uh, within the Lake Champlain Basin. Lake Champlain is not considered part of the Great Lakes, but it's considered by some to be the other Great Lake. So I was wondering how applicable are these lessons to Lake Champlain? I would think probably fairly usable with the Lake Champlain re region as well. Um, I would still consider that not too far out of the Great Lakes region. Um, certainly it's not coastal, so I would think that a number of these activities would work just as well for you. You also might find on the Great Lakes Literacy.net site that we have a set of activities called Fresh and Salt. And just, this is just for everybody, that if you're looking to draw comparisons between freshwater and saltwater, all of the fresh and salt activities, that is the point of those lessons, is to be able to, to draw comparisons between the two ecosystems. So that might be a benefit to you as well. But I, I actually would not have any problem saying that a lot of these could be easily used with Lake Champlain. Some of the data sets you know, might not quite be as applicable, but you can probably find something comparable for your region exactly. And I believe there's actually a Sea Grant program for Lake Champlain. So they might be able to help you out if you can't find data sets on the internet on your own. Yes, actually, I remember meeting somebody at a training from Lake Champlain, and that might be who we're talking to right now. I'm not sure because I can't see that. There is another question. Um, I work for the SPCSC, and I'm 
I believe that might be the Coastal Services Center. Okay, awesome. I don't know all every acronym that's out there. Education and the government seem to have more acronyms than we know what to do with. Um, and there are 69 tribes, 69 tribes in our region. Do you know of any resources for tribal education and climate change? That's an interesting question. I don't particularly. If somebody else does, I would love to hear about it. Um, I really, I don't know anything that is specific to tribal education. I know um, Minnesota, if there's anybody on from Minnesota? I was um, wrong, I have to admit. It's the South Central Climate Science Center. Apologies okay. for that. Um, regarding the, the tribal question, um, I know there's great tribal education going on up in Minnesota. I can picture the person. Um, Dr. Fortner, maybe you can help me out. It's is it Jennifer? It starts with an N. I can picture her. Um, she works with the tribal education programs uh, up in Dil in Duluth, and they have a fabulous education component up there. Um, that's probably the place that I would start if I had to to go from scratch here. I would say University of Minnesota Duluth. And it's Jennifer, and her last name starts with an N. And that's all I can tell you because I'm blanking on it. Christina's putting some more things up here for us so that everybody can see them. That's it. Yes, then me, Mike. Yes, thank you. And Dr. Fortner made a very good point. Why would tribal education be any different? That you know, the science is the same all the way through, and I, I think I would agree with that. Jennifer Nimai, N I E M I, is her name. Those are all the questions we have so far. Um, any other questions, please feel free to post those in the chat box, and we'll, we'll read them off and pass them along. I'm going to post this here to a... Okay, there is another question, but I'm just, in case people are jumping on and off or things, um, please, and I think Christina put this in the chat box as well, Watch for an email. Um, we would love some feedback on the webinar. We've done a couple of these now, and it's always a challenge for me, just because this is a different kind of education than I'm used to. Um, but we do also have certificates, in case you need them for professional development certification or anything like that. In that follow-up email, there is a survey, and in that survey, it's a very short 10-question survey, but there's the opportunity for you to give us the information so that we can get a certificate out to you should you need that. And other question. The question is, uh, do you have any resources for agriculture impacts with climate change or impacts of agriculture on Great Lakes in light of climate change? The one thing I'm going to mention before I let Lindsay take that is that one of the... Um, keep going, keep going. Um, Bye. That one of the um, um, feature articles that Lindsay talked about under the uh, when she talked about the changing climate website does cover agriculture impacts in the Great Lakes, and there's also a webinar pretty early on in the series that might be of interest. And also, um, Dr. Rachel Hintz, I saw her name as one of the attendees. She and um, another professor, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name. Um, Richard Moore. Um, they are. They do a workshop uh, very similar to what Dr. Fortner and I have been doing up at Stone Lab, and theirs is on agricultural agriculture and sustainability and climate change. And she's actually on the website or on this webinar now. I don't know if she's still on, but she was before. And she would be the person I would say if you're wanting to look at the agricultural impact. I think they are actually looking to develop a curriculum with that focus in mind. And her name is Rachel Hintz, H-I-N-T-Z, and Christina's trying to see if 
she can. If anyone is interested in learning more about that course, you should have all gotten an email from me previously. So if you want to um, let me know, and I will pass that information along to Rachel. Yeah, she. They'll be doing, I believe, the same course. They they'll are. be. Yeah, they're doing that course this summer up at Stone Lab. Um. There's another question. Um, I'll let you go ahead and read it. I'm trying to place where that was. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Angie Green has a question that says, are there professional development certificates available for the climate webinars? That's a good point. I know that we've done that for a few of them that were specifically focused on a um, community planners and engineers. I don't know that we've talked about that for all of the webinars, but if there's interest, I will definitely see what I can do about that. And Angie, I think that's something we can very easily do um, because we just Knowing from the teacher standpoint, we basically need documentation that shows we've participated in the professional development. And I would certainly say that if there's, I know you've done a lot of them, um, I think we could easily put that together for you to show that you've participated on those because we would have records of when people were on them and that could be done. I think that might be something that's a great idea that in the future webinars um, to say that if, if someone needs record of participation that we can help provide that because that's certainly something that's easy for us to do. Those are the questions that we have so um, Someone is asking about automatically receiving the certificate as part of completing the survey. What actually happens is there's a survey question in there that says, would you like a certificate of completion and please give us your contact information. So as long as you fill out the survey and complete that question, we will get that certificate to you. Now we can, we pretty much will put them together within the next couple, you know, the next day or two kind of thing and send them back out via email. It's a pretty, pretty easy and painless process especially coming from the educator standpoint and having to document everything that you turn in. Right. We can do that. Um, I am going to pull my screen just because I do need to acknowledge who funds all of this kind of stuff. We should make sure that we do that. Um, a lot of the funding for the grant that allowing us to do this came out of a DLRI grant. Um, and there's, we have a NOAA climate grant as well. And certainly the partnership, the Climate change webinars are truly a partnership of multiple departments here at Ohio State working on climate change initiatives. Is there anything else? I'm, I'm sorry I haven't filled your two hours in entirety. Um, this, uh, this is longer than I normally talk in my classroom anyways. I'm a, I'm a a doer of labs more than a, a lecturer, so this is a different kind of setup for me. And I, my contact information was back on the first slide, and I can put that back up, and Christina's as well. And I do believe we are recording this. We are. Um, if you are registered for this webinar, you will receive an email letting you know that um, the recording is available online and that will include the link and everything. Um, it will also be posted on the Changing Climate website, the exact same place where you signed up for the webinar. Um, again, if there's questions that come up later on, please feel free to get in touch with us. Absolutely. Um, we definitely want to hear back from you. If you have any input on the lessons, if you use them, let us know about it. 
we definitely want to hear about that as well. Um, yeah, I, I, if there's no other questions, I believe we are done for today and you get to get out early. Yeah, I used to love that when I was in school. <laughs> Yes, certainly please do not hesitate to email, um, and if you are using it or you're starting to do an activity and you, you need the teacher perspective of is this going to work or is this going to um, take too long or something like that, don't hesitate to drop me an email. That's my school email. That's the one that I'm on 90% of the time during the day. Um, it's the easiest place to get me, and I, I'm pretty attached to the email. So <laughs> I, can, I get back to people pretty quickly. Um, we're also going to make plug for STEM Labs. So it's near and dear to many of our hearts, those of us that are on here. Um, if you are interested, uh, this year I don't believe we are offering the climate change workshop, but we are offering Great Lakes Education, Dr. Fortner and I, but uh, Dr. Hintz and Dr. Moore are going to offer climate and sustainability that focuses on agriculture. And both of those are one week, best science professional development of your life. Uh, it's one week living up on the island uh, at Stone Lab, and you are truly immersed in what you are doing day and night. You don't sit very much up there, but for some reason you're never tired. I don't know how that works, but I just know that's the case. And if you are interested, you can contact either Christina or myself, and we can get you information about the courses that are going on at Stone Lab. And also, if you are looking at the Great Lakes Education one this summer, we have $500 scholarships available or people that want to participate in that course. Dr. Fortner has funding, and we are also getting some funding from EPA for Great Lakes Education. So there are $500 scholarships out there to help you cover workshop costs, which is fabulous. And we just recently got all of the print materials for the next summer at Stone Lab in, so if you would like any of those, let me know. I can get those out to you. Um, the other thing to mention for classroom teachers is that we have a Lake Erie Science Field Trip Program. Um, one day or two day field trips coming up to the lab. Um, students get to go out on a boat, do some of the things that um, our summer students do, that our scientists do up there. And that's another piece of information that I'd be happy to share with you if you want to get in touch with me. There's a question about dates for the courses. And I'm pulling out my book right now because I can give that to you. I believe those are the end of July. Yes, that's July 21st through the 27th yes. is Great Lakes Education. And then the week mm -hmm. after, I believe, is the Climate and Sustainability course. Those are one week courses and they're awesome. It's what got me hooked into all of this in the first place. I went up literally 13 years ago and I'm still there. There's also a question somebody said they didn't log on until late and they've missed it. Um, is the PowerPoint also, Christina? We can put all of that up on the website okay. along with the recording. And um, we'll, we'll email you when that's available. I want to thank everybody who listened in. Um, I hope that you found pieces of art useful and, and informative, and at least, if nothing else, you have a, a resource or two between the Changing Climate site and the Great Lakes Literacy um, like Great Lakes Literacy .net site that you have at your fingertips now. Some Great Lakes science education information that you can go to. I think we are finished. Thank you, everybody, and we appreciate it. Have a good weekend. Great. Thank you.